Welcome to Om Times TV, a division of Om Times Media and Broadcasting. Sex is the life force energy that runs through us all. The link between sex, creativity, and the sense of aliveness is strong. Can you use sexual energy for your spiritual evolution? or perhaps for emotional healing. Is it even possible? Clinical sexologist Dr. Martha Tara Lee will explore all these and more on the Eros Evolution Show here on Ohm Times Radio and TV. Hello, hello, and welcome to Eros Evolution today. My name is Martha. I am a relationship counselor, clinical sexologist, and uh, I don't have any guests today. Uh, in today's show, I'll be talking about uh, five epic ways in which you can have better sex. And this is uh, such a topic that, uh, I, that I hold so close to my heart because, um, of course, besides being somebody who supports people around their sexuality, I also am someone who uh, does have sex. And um, over the years, I have pulled everything that I've... Uh, learned um kind of kind of like through my personal experiences and also through my um work with my clients to make sense of how to uh, best explain the differences between people and um, the way they prefer to be sexual and i know in our world we do not like to put things into um boxes and also to make it black and white. So a lot of what I'm sharing is really about um, shedding light on the possible differences in which you and your partner may prefer to be sexual. Uh, so it's really meant for more like a guideline rather than definitive uh, ways. So I really hope that you take uh, these five ways with a pinch of salt, a big pinch of salt and uh, also uh, the advice that i'm going to be uh, suggesting uh, is applicable to people of all sexual orientations and uh, gender identities um, there's really no right or wrong uh, around it so i'm also very mindful of using languaging like men and women but say if i use the words men and women uh, i've been caught out on it and i think what people doesn't understand in my head i'm actually talking about my personal experiences and professional experience working with people who are cisgender heterosexual men women so when i say men women i'm very intentional by referring to heterosexual people and uh, when i say uh, partners i'm talking to uh, talking about in general and uh, it uh, this this information i'm sharing is really applicable to all people so I cannot speak of uh, four people who uh, are of different gender identities because um, I haven't really had that much experiences with them. So I still feel that um, what the five ways that I'll be sharing will be useful to all of you. So uh, do take it in the spirit in which it's being shared. And um, I hope it's helpful to you. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned, the, the five ways to be an epic lover I've, I came across uh through my personal experiences tried to make sense of it in my professional life and i kept seeing this again and again happening with my clients uh, so for a very long time i really didn't share this publicly only uh recently i um i i i decided to share this in a in a simple way uh with with well basically i never put it put my thoughts to paper until recently so I had been communicating it. It kind of was all in my head and um, did mention in private sessions, but never put pen to paper uh, until recently. So as I started to do it and I got a positive response, that, that was when I realized, hey, maybe I could turn it into an episode on uh, Eros Evolution today. Okay, so having uh, gone through the kind of background into it, um, I will just now launch into it. <laughs> okay, so the first one is um, as somebody who is in a female body, who identifies as heterosexual, um, a lot of times I found that uh, when I started being sexual, that the way my partner was approaching me felt really jarring. It felt 
um, abrasive, if it just didn't feel nice. Um, however, I also had the opportunity to be with partners who uh, were better at teasing, teasing the mood and uh, doing extended foreplay. And so I started to have an idea of how I liked to be approached. So by that, what I mean is, uh, personally, I would prefer the touch to be non-linear, meaning do not go directly for the genitals, not going directly for uh, the breasts and the vulva. Uh, instead, focusing on the kissing, the cuddling, the stroking, and just all over the body teasing out. So I call it non-linear, non, non so meaning not directly, not directly going for the genitals. However, I did find in my personal experiences, a lot of um, my partners um, guiding my hand and encouraging me to just go for their genitals. So here I am in a heterosexual um, interaction where all my almost all my partners prefer me to just go directly for their genitals and i didn't like it uh, if this was done to me so the number one way to be an epic lover is to start to get a sense of is my partner a more direct person or a more non-linear person so that's the first tip that i have for you and uh, this applies to people with different sexual orientation and gender identities because uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that just because you're a heterosexual man you will always like it to be direct uh, it can mean you prefer the touch to be non-linear and that is perfectly okay this is just a way to uh, navigate the the languaging around um, how do I actually approach my partner so in a lot of my work, I call it opposites attract. So if you're somebody who's non-linear like myself, so you may have a partner who is more direct, uh, direct approach, just go directly for their genitals. But from time to time, I did come across partners who were not like that, who were more sensual, and uh, everything just felt magical when you are with someone who is very similar to you because they get you and you get them. And uh, that's really, really fun as well. And there's no right or wrong about it. It's not that uh, opposites attract. You will definitely attract somebody who prefers a more direct approach. It just means that um, it is more likely to happen. And on those times that it doesn't happen, at least you have the languaging around, okay, so now I have a partner who is more non-linear, uh, similar to me. And so this is just about making sense of the languaging around it. So I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, am I a more direct approach kind of a person or am I a more non-linear kind of a person? And if so, what is my partner? Um, is my partner the opposite? And if not, is my partner more of non-linear? So I'm, I know I'm talking about the both spectrums of it and it could be, oh, my partner um, doesn't mind either and my partner uh, uh, is open to both or response uh, just as well with both. Uh, depending on their mood and that's fine but also seeing what, what whether a majority of time they they uh, lean more towards uh, one approach so it's kind of like a guideline to support you so that um you 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 kind of have a clue you know it's like having a clue uh, rather than uh feeling totally clueless about the whole thing and not sure how to act about it Okay, so now that I've gone into uh, number one, the approach, now I go to number two, which is the touch. So I, I noticed that uh, when I started being sexual, I noticed that a lot of my partners were touching me in ways that were too uh, rough. It felt rough. It, it felt that my body was getting, getting um, overstimulated uh, too quickly. And uh, what re felt really, really nice on my body was when the touch was super soft and super slow. When it was soft, I'm talking about it as soft as like a feather. So almost triggering like goosebumps feeling soft. And the slowness, 
um, I sometimes describe it like as slow as a tortoise, like really, really slow or as slow as they can. And so what the soft slow does uh, on my body is that it comes down my nervous system, it awakens by my skin. And because it's soft and slow, I've, I, I interpreted the soft and slow touch as uh, intentionality. I interpreted the soft and slow touch as um, more care and more love. Somehow, when the touch was soft and slow, I interpreted it as love and uh, connection, um, closeness, vulnerability. So even though it was it was just the way the touch was being rendered, um, however, the 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 way I was registering it was okay. I'm not being used as an object. I I um, I'm having more attention on me. And uh, so it felt really good, and uh, that really helped me to get turned on. So another thing about uh, uh, this soft slow is this whole sense of sensuality around it. So when I talk about sensuality, I often link it to the senses of the person. So in this particular case, when the touch is soft and slow, uh, the sensuality came from the way the touch was, which was making the person feel awakened, uh, through their body and awakening the body through touch so somebody who is more sensuous uh, will appreciate all the shades of the senses being stimulated from the touch from the smell around the room from the feel of the sheets um, and even the general ambience of the room whether it was clean like these little things uh, does affect somebody's ability to feel sexy and to feel open to intimacy, physical intimacy. So I'm describing myself and uh, using that as a framework of helping you understand what I mean by the five epic ways. So the first one just now was direct, the second one is touch. So I started to describe uh, soft, slow and sensuous being uh, a, a, a possible way of their preference of touch. And so now I'm gonna to go to the other uh, person who may have a tendency of preferring the touch to be what I call half, half fast, direct, um, and sexual. So these people would prefer the touch to be harder, um, a certain kind of a rhythm. They would prefer it to be direct, go directly for the genitals. They would prefer it to be hard. And their sexual style uh, is more likely to be sexual. So rather than uh, all the slowness awakening the senses, um, they prefer to just go directly for the genitals. And when I refer sexual in this context, I'm referring to uh, them preferring uh, sex to be penis in vagina or penis in, in um, anus um, kind of friction um, sex. So these people just, okay, all systems go as long as I am excited, as long as I'm aroused, just go for it. So these people tend to prefer to, they associate sex as not just the whole body, but actually very much a genital focus, very much about uh, the penetration. And penetration doesn't have to mean, mean penis in vagina. Penetration could mean uh, penis in anus uh, for people who identify as bisexual, gay, uh, transgender, and also like digital penetration, digital meaning like a uh, finger or, digit, uh, or it could be uh, with the use of a toy. So still, still very much about penetration. So when I um, talk about the, uh, uh, once again, opposites attract, uh, if you are a soft, soul sensual person like myself, is there a possibility that you have a partner who uh, prefers their sexual uh, style to be hard, fast, uh, direct, and sexual? So the touch to be uh, faster, harder. And I have uh, worked with um, heterosexual uh, couples who then um, identify what I'm saying and say, oh my God, that's me. I like. So I noticed that in my work, even though I'm uh, describing my personal experience and this is my preference. A lot of women uh, who are heterosexual prefer the touch to be soft, slow, sensual, and then their partner prefer the touch to be hard, fast, direct, and sexual. And um, 
it's almost like a duck and chicken talking and uh, both of them having a very definitive preference and feeling very frustrated about you don't get me. I've tried to tell me what I like and you are not giving me what I like. Why are you not giving me what I like? I have told you what I think I like and uh, or they have tried it and they really know that they like it and then their partner is still not giving that to them. So they feel really frustrated and so I've had to come in many times to try to get them to describe what they like and uh, in my experiences a lot of times um, I, I noticed that that happens to heterosexual people and uh, but I also really do not like to um, again once again emphasizing this is just a generalization it may it may be that uh, a heterosexual woman prefers uh, touch to be hard fast direct and sexual as well and that's nothing wrong with it it's just a guideline so I keep emphasizing this because I'm so afraid of being attacked for using the wrong languaging. It's just a framework to help you navigate yourself uh, when uh, regardless of what it is that you you navigate, uh, you prefer more of, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. We are just different. Everyone is different. And uh, what I'm sharing is just some tips that may help. So what happens with uh, a touch also is that, um, uh, so I'd like to share um, this little story. Um, and this actually happens more than once. So I'm not just talking about one particular uh, client. So one, one client came in and said, um, they noticed this happening in their relationship. Exactly this guideline that I mentioned, women preferring it to be soft, slow, sensual, and men preferring it to be hard, fast, direct. Um, and I know I'm making generalizations. So this particular couple came, came in and the guy said, um, she doesn't get it. She doesn't like that. I want it to be hard and fast. Uh, when she goes so slow uh, on me, it doesn't make sense. I want to fall asleep. And then she asked me to go slow on her and I don't get it. I don't get why she wants me to go soft and slow on her. Uh, it's so slow and so slow, soft that I fall asleep. And I was like, excuse me, she's asking for what she needs and you are you are dismissing what she has asked and making what she, her, what she has asked for wrong because it doesn't make sense to you, but it makes sense to her. So you really need to respect what she's asking for and uh, really honor the fact that she is just different from you. There's nothing wrong about her liking something different from you. And so just give it to her and see how it feels. But when it comes to you and your body, she cannot assume that you like it to be soft and slow. You are able to speak up that you like it to be hard and fast. And it doesn't need to make sense to her either. But she needs to respect that she that you like it to be hard and uh, harder and faster. So it was this whole, oh, right? Because I, I think what happens is that we have our preferences. We ask for it. Uh, we, we, we stumble upon it and we may not have the languaging around explaining or advocating for ourselves the kind of touch that we like. But what is so frustrating is when your partner turns around and shames you for it and says there's something wrong with you for liking this or what you like doesn't make sense. So it's, it's a kind of gaslighting that what, what you're saying is not true. And uh, that really makes people so frustrated when you have already asked for what you want and you still are not getting it. So when I was younger, um, and I, I do get uh, sore and uh, I do go into pain very quickly. So I try asking for my partner to uh, stimulate or touch me in a way that was slower and softer, slower and softer. And I noticed that I would keep repeating myself like after three or uh you know after three to five times of repeating myself and uh them doing exactly what they wanted to do anyway um that was when i felt you know what um it really doesn't pay off to speak it doesn't pay off to speak up in the bedroom i've asked for what i want and i'm telling you i'm in pain i'm telling you that i'm sore and yet they wouldn't do what i've asked them to do uh, on what feels good for me. And so I got really frustrated and really, really angry that what what's the point of communicating if you're just going to do what you want to do anyway? Uh, so what happened was um, um, I, I thought that uh, my lovers who just did what they 
what they wanted to do anyway were just selfish or they were just bad communicators. They were not listening to me or they're unable to listen to me uh, or they're making what I like wrong. And so I just I just let them do what they want to do. I felt angry, violated and um, shut down towards that experience and even shut down towards them because if uh, you are communicating your needs and your partner is not listening to you, at some point you do feel really unsafe with this person. Um, so when I went to sex school, and uh, we talked about uh, the importance of communication. And it wasn't that I was uh, for lack of communicating with my partner. Uh, suddenly, one day I realized, oh, no, I didn't actually tell them more specifically how I wanted them to touch me. I was communicating softer and slower, but I wasn't communicating how much softer and slower. So, for instance, uh, being able to say something like 50% softer, 50% softer uh, would be so much so useful to somebody who actually thinks um, in very literal terms that they needed more specific feedback. And so I, I, own, I own my side of my pain that I have been experiencing over the years and also my frustration ar around sex because even though I was communicating something and slow, I wasn't communicating even more clearly how slow and how soft. So that was something that was like a big epiphany for me. Another thing that uh, came up for me as I uh, became a sex educator and I, I read a lot about sexuality and uh, better sexual experiences all the time was uh, one day I stumbled upon this uh, little bit of a uh, nugget of information that, uh, okay, so anyway, in, uh, before I go into that, when I was in sex school, I was taught that for a very long time, the medical industry uh, doctors they would look at uh, women as a smaller version of a man. And so they were just giving, uh, they would do all this research around medication for men. Um, but then when it came to diagnosing and uh, prescribing uh, dosages of medication to women, they just uh, gave us a smaller dosage based on the fact that our body was just smaller. So it was like if a woman is 20% smaller, then they would give like 20% less of that particular dosage. But there wasn't enough research around uh, sexual me uh, around medicine for women. And they found out that men and women actually experience um, uh, effects uh, differently. And they actually um, respond to pain differently. So, you know... Um, heterosexual women, um, uh, cisgender uh, people who want to have babies, um, they, they, um, they, I mean, okay, I'm just going to say for, for women, a lot of times uh, we are told that, oh, we are very strong because we can give birth. But um, the piece of nugget that I came across was that uh, women um, or people uh, in female bodies tend to have, uh, they have 20% uh, um, thinner skin than men. So if we are thinner, we have a, we have skin that is 20% thinner than men, regardless of your gender identity. Uh, what happens is that, could this explain why a lot of women or people uh, uh, in female bodies prefer touch to be soft, slow and sensuous because we are actually feeling sensation and also pain differently. So this lit up a light bulb in my body which explained to me finally why I prefer touch to be soft, slow, sensuous whereas I had partners who preferred touch to be harder and faster and more directly and also more sexual. Um, so that, I hope, uh, wraps up that piece around touch. <laughs> so far, I have uh, described, um, I'm, so today I'm talking about five epic ways to be, five ways to be an epic lover. And so far, I've described uh, approach. So for the approach to be going directly to the genitals or not directly to the genitals, going, uh, for instance, all over the body, treating the body as a magical wonderland. The second one is touch. Are you somebody who prefers touch to be soft, slow, sensuous, or are, uh, 
or are you somebody who prefers touch to be hard fast direct and if so what about your partner uh, maybe you are with your opposite or maybe you are with somebody who is more of a same for with you who pref also prefers touch to be soft slow sensuous for instance so in that case you kind of have a little guide clues of how you can better approach your partner so here i'm just giving you the languaging around it and it's up to you to uh, treat this as little nuggets of clues on how you can be better uh, in terms of approaching your partner in, in terms of uh, being a better lover for your partner so there are three more points that i want to cover the third one is uh, build up so when it comes to building up the sexual sensation ple pleasure um, and we are talking about building up so that uh, one can then lead to uh, orgasm, ejaculation. Uh, so you approach them in this way and then you touch them in a certain way. And then the build up, um, I call it a variety or consistency. So some people prefer the build up to be, to be you do a whole bunch of things, different things. Some people prefer the build up to be consistent. So in order uh, as you get more and more sexually excited in order for somebody to go over the edge to orgasm uh, we all need a certain consistency however is the build up more exciting for the person if they are doing different things a whole bunch of different things variety or it, are they more into doing the same old same old uh, they like uh, having having sex in the same way uh, or you can call it routine sex and uh, it, it's just different for different people. So you, you want to use that also as a framework. Is your partner somebody who likes more variety in the bedroom, uh, doing different things to them and doing new things to them? Or is your partner somebody who likes the uh, pressure, the touch, the rhythm to be more consistent? Or are they also somebody who prefers the sex to be pretty much always the same thing? So that is the third uh, way of uh, being an epic lover. And uh, we, we have a break and we'll be back after this break. Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds Walk a mile in my shoes Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my, in my shoes. shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes Hello, we are back and uh, welcome to Eros Evolution. In today's episode, we're talking about five ways to be an epic lover. And uh, just before the break, I was talking about uh, giving some suggestions. The first one is the way you approach your partner. The second one is the way you touch your partner. The third one is the build up towards the peak, whether your partner prefers more variety or uh, through the whole session or your partner prefers more consistency through the whole session, partner being a more routine kind of a person. So people who like a, a more variety in the bedroom would not like to do things in the same way all the time. 
So what happens when you are somebody who likes uh, things to be same old, same old, uh, if it's not broken, don't fix it. But you are with a partner who feels bored easily and so wants more variety in the bedroom. So it can be very frustrating for somebody who likes more variety in the bedroom to be with somebody who likes more routine sex. So the person with uh, who likes more variety in the bedroom may sometimes come to me and ask me, uh, how do I introduce new things to the bedroom? My partner is resistant to it. My partner is not open to having uh, sex in a different way. So this is when I will um, suggest to the person who likes more variety or the person who would like to introduce new things to the bedroom to be very gentle with the partner. Not just talk about what they would like to try, but also why they like to try it. It doesn't have to be that you figured all uh, everything out that you you know you love it. It could be you genuinely uh, have not tried this before and you're curious about it. So when your partner uh, who is resistant to change, uh, who prefers consistency to uh, immediately shut you down, it's very easy to say no. So the person who wants to try something new might feel really uh, discouraged. And it's really important to not take it personal. Do not treat this as a rejection of you or of, or, or of your love or that, uh, you know, they don't love you enough uh, uh, or they don't care enough to try. Um, but, re but, but rather that don't take it personal as in it, it, it could be all about them uh, being a creature of habit and uh, not not being willing, uh, ready to try new things is scary for them. So what could you do to make it less scary for them? And uh, bearing in mind, not take it personal. So do not accept their first no and as an absolute no, because uh, you have to understand if uh, someone is uh, resistant to change and resistant to things that are new, that uh, it's really important to uh, be gentle with them and to see where they're coming from as well. So rather than say something like, oh, should we try this or could we try this? And then they immediately say no, you can go one step further rather than shut down and just treat it as, oh, okay, I guess then then, then I, I don't know where to go with that. Instead of uh, doing that, you can actually invite a dialogue and say, uh, may I know uh, uh, how, you, how you feel about it? Uh, you know, you're saying no, I'm hearing that you're saying no and I want to respect you for it, but I'm just curious uh, why is this a no for you? I just want to understand you better. So when you start to have a dialogue around it, then you can see what what actually is the reason they are saying no so that maybe you can meet them where they're at. So for instance, somebody who says uh, they don't like blindfolds uh, or they don't want to use blindfolds in the bedroom and they say no, ask them why they are not okay with blindfolds. Ask them what blindfolds makes them feel. Uh, and then maybe you can offer an option like, for instance, we don't use the blindfold on you, we use the blindfold on me instead. And don't worry about uh, using it on me and assuming that just because we use it on me, that I'm going to uh, insist that we use it on you. You know, this tit for tat, fairness kind of a thing. So if they hear that uh, you are open to trying blindfolds on you and there's nothing about forcing them, then uh, they might be more open to trying blindfolds with you because it's, it's, uh, it's using blindfolds on you and not on them. And then the next thing is after trying blindfolds on you, uh, you can share off your experience and how it makes you feel. And what this does, it invokes a spirit of curiosity and playfulness because you had a, a good experience and you're describing it and then they get curious about it and what happens is now there's a dialogue around it. So then you can start to invite them uh, by saying, uh, well, we tried blindfolds on me and it was really fun and I would love to try it on you. So what would it take for you to be willing to try blindfolds for a while? So how about we create safety about trying blindfolds on you? For instance, uh, we try it for uh, 30 seconds and see how you feel. Uh, um, and uh, you can come up with uh, code words or safety signals or time limits so that your partner is more willing to try it on you. So for instance, uh, okay, why don't we just try the blindfolds on you? But um, I'm not gonna do. Uh, I'm not gonna sit on you and uh, ha start ha uh, grinding on you and having penetrative sex. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do this, this, this instead, and that's it. So being able to create safety is so important uh, in, in introducing somebody who prefers things to be the same way and uh, slowly invoking a variety. Another tip that I have around. Um, a variety besides uh, breaking down to smaller steps, talking to them, uh, checking uh, what is their lowest common denominator of trying something new is maybe do not introduce too many new things at the same time. 
So just one new thing. Uh, so at the start of the session, being able to talk about it and saying, I would like to try this. This is how I would like to try. And this is what it would mean to me. And this is what success would look like. And uh, then um, partner will feel a lot less uh, intimidated. Also not talking about it just before sex, you know, like there's this some kind of uh, we're wasting time talking, even being able to talk about uh, trying new things before you try it, like way before you try it. And um, it's also another tip that I have around navigating, working with people who are resistant to trying new things in the bedroom. So that's the third tip that I have, uh, all the build up. And then I talked about build up being variety and consistency. The fourth tip, the fourth way to be an epic lover. Okay, this is really, really super powerful uh, and super simple is that you mirror them. Okay, you mirror your partner. So if your partner likes... Uh, uh, approach to be direct, then you do direct. Uh, you, you know, they're doing it to you, then you do it back to them. If your partner is uh, liking a hard, fast, sensual, sexual, but you are not, but it doesn't really matter, throw that out the window for the moment and just mirror them. Uh, do to them what they do back to you. A lot of times we do to our partners, not because we are cruel, mean people, like what I assumed when I was younger, because they were not taking my feedback. They were doing it to me because that felt good to them. That's their natural instinct. And uh, because it's their natural instinct, it feels good to them. They assume, they project onto you that they think that that's what you like. And uh, sometimes um, a lot of people will say, why should I go along with what they like? Uh, it's, it's wrong. They should listen to me. They should stop. But what if you are with somebody who doesn't have a lot of uh, sex education around themselves, that they are not very aware of the differences, that they haven't had any of these embodied experience that they're like um, behaving like a little puppy, like super excited around sex and uh, associating this super excitedness and this like being very uh, rough around sex, uh, um, associating that as passionate. What if they never meant any harm? And in order to get them to calm down, sometimes one of the ways is to do what they like, do it their way, let them feel seen, let them feel heard, let them feel validated. And then introducing to them you know we did it your way and um i hope you like it but uh it's not really um the thing that i like the most so then being able to then share and introduce some of the things that you like instead so this creates a win-win because they feel seen and heard you've married them you've done it their way and now they are more open to doing it your way because they may not understand they would they now start it's now starts to dawn on them that actually what uh they were doing you it could be better for you so this is where you can be very gentle by saying hey how about we try this today or hey um um for people who have difficulties um actually articulating what they like you could say something like um i i i i would like to try something but i'm not sure how to explain it so can i just do it on you and then after that you do it back to me so i call it trainer trainer you just show them what you like so it's much easier to then shift things around so i i often i say yeah you know we have our definitive preferences and it's okay to do it sometimes their way but it's also just as important to speak up for yourself and to make sure that you do it your way some of the time and being flexible around that being able because it gets very frustrating if you're always doing it their way and you're always feeling like you're bending over backwards and you're not getting what you really like so can you begin to see that a lot of what i'm describing is uh also about advocating for yourself and treating the whole uh way of, that you're having um, sex as not a right and wrong so this is where a lot of people use throw around the word sexual chemistry i guess we don't fit well together i guess we don't we don't get each other because if we get each other we shouldn't need to communicate about this i think that's totally untrue okay so the fifth tip that i have for you uh, is a very big piece around communication 
So I talked about five epic ways. The first one being approach, the second one being touch, the third one being built up, the fourth one being mirroring them. Uh, and then the fifth one is now sexual communication. So let's backtrack a little bit to mirroring them. So when I talk about mirroring them and uh, I'm talking about the way they approach, the way they touch, the way they uh, prefer variety or consistency, but the mirroring can also be uh, where they touch you. So for instance, if they always have the tendency to go for your ear or the back of your neck or a certain part of your body, uh, that maybe you don't really like, but notice uh, notice enough of what they're doing so that you do it back to them and see what's their response. Because sometimes uh, what they're doing to you doesn't really work for you, but it's what they like. And so when you do it at that sweet spot uh, that they like, then it's going to be that, wow, you get me. Wow, it's so great. Wow, you're so good. Wow, you're so intuitive. But in reality, um, what he's doing with the mirroring is that uh, they are unconsciously, subconsciously asking you to do it with for them, uh, but they they have they may they may have difficulties articulating it. So that's that whole it's so difficult to describe everything that you like to the T. So when they do it on you, sometimes it's like okay, it's not really working for me. It's not really like um, it's not really like um. um doing anything for me, but why do they keep doing it? Do they think that I like it? So that was kind of how I came across it because I was like, why Why do they keep doing this to me? I didn't say that I like it. Why do they keep doing this to me? And then I was like, maybe I do it back to them and see what, what, what happens. And so that's how I stumbled upon the mirroring. When you mirror someone that you know you are like uh it's like jamming you know like uh, in uh, in music you know you jam together you you kind of listen to what the other person is doing and then you kind of follow along and then it's like a dance you follow along and then you put like this extra beat and then they follow you and so this jamming of this uh it's like a dance so what if you do some of what they like and then th then you can kind of intuitively uh, even without words kind of get them to do what you like so the mirroring can also be mirroring their breath. If you mirror their breath, you know, you breathe uh, just like uh, with them, you breathe in an excited way, you breathe in a calming way. They feel connected to you uh, in a non-verbal way. And uh, that's going to be uh, so amazing to feel that you're in sync with someone, uh, to have that feeling that you're one, okay, is another uh, thing that I want to mention about mirroring. Okay, so now let's moving on to sexual communication. Uh, it's a really big piece, okay, around sexual communication. And I was very fortunate that this was something that me and my partner, my first sexual partner did. And so I always had that whole thing around communication being such an important part of not making assumptions uh, around sexual activity. And uh, it was only later when I... Um, started talking about sex with my friends and um, became a sexologist, working with clients that I started to realize so many people do not talk about sex during sex. A lot of people do not talk about sex at all. A lot of people are having sex. Uh, a lot of my clients, a lot of people that I know of, uh, they are having sex, but they don't talk about sex. So I realized that uh, the way that I was having sex because it was very much influenced by my first partner was very different from anybody else that I know of. So now I'm going to talk about the framework of communication that me and my partner used to do. So the first one was when I was new to sex, my partner was very gentle to me. And so um, before a, a sex session, uh, we would call it a session, uh, we would, uh, we would, he, he would sit me down and then he would say, okay, we are not going to have a session. And I was like, oh, is this what people do? They talk about the session before session. <laughs> so I didn't know better, right? Because it was my first partner. And uh, so, but he would do that. He'll say, okay, we are not going to have a session. And I'm like, okay. Uh, so how are you feeling? Um, are you like tired? Are you thirsty? Are you sleepy? Are you hungry? And uh, depending on what I'm feeling, or do you need to pee? Depending on what I'm feeling, uh, then we will address some of that immediately. Meaning like if I needed to pee, go pee, you know, thirsty drink. But if I'm hungry, then he would say, okay, fine. Since you're hungry, then uh, let's have a shorter section. Uh, let's have half an hour. Do you think you can wait half an hour? So before sex, we would actually do what I started to then call a check-in. So he would do a physical check-in. And um, then uh, we would then do a kind of like... Uh, emotional check-in like uh we're okay like we're cool uh maybe like we had a fight or whatever and maybe we'll like address that then then or maybe we'll, we'll say something like let's talk about that later 
Let's talk about that later. And then fulfilling their promise of talking to that later. Later as in half an hour later or one day later or over the weekend, for instance. So we'll do a physical check-in, um, uh, emotional check-in, like how are we as a couple? Uh, and then uh, or in, in, in some cases, maybe you're not in a couple relationship and that's fine, but able to talk about... Um, how you're feeling about each other emotionally can also be a check-in. And um, then we do the mental check-in. So the mental check-in would be, can be linked to your in, uh, your intention of the session, can be linked to your fears around the session. So the mental check-in could be, um, uh, so the last time this happened, how you're feeling about this? Should we try it today? Um, so, or saying like, the last time this happened, we don't want to do this again. So this is what we're not going to do. How do you feel about that? So mentally, how you feel about it? Another mental um, kind of uh, assurance that my, um, my partner would do is saying something like, uh, so just try to keep an open mind, just be positive. Uh, um, so mentally making sure that we are both on the same page. So this is where after the check-in, you can also go into your, uh, very very quickly go into your intention around the session. Like in this session, what are we trying to accomplish? Like is this a session uh, for me to uh, perform hand job upload on you? Or is this session about you like helping me to have an orgasm or like practicing fingering? Uh, or is this session like trying, trying a new sex toy? So like being able to talk about it rather than pounce it onto your partner. So the check-in, physical, mental, emotional, and then the intention, and then maybe you can articulate your fears around the session and also talking about what you would do after the session so that you continue the, the connection, the relationship that you have with the person. So for instance, like, hey, after this session, I have to run off, but um, I would love to like check in with you. I would love to talk to you uh, later in this week, uh, say on Wednesday. So like being able to talk about the way forward would be really great because it doesn't make the person uh, feel that, that they are left hanging. So this is the whole before that uh, me and my partner used to do. Imagine like this was my first sexual partner and uh, we did this every single session. We did this before every single session. And so... Uh, for the life of me, I couldn't understand why a lot of people uh, later on when I did hookups and stuff, uh, for the life of me, it just doesn't feel good when we didn't really did just talk about sex a little bit before sex. And so I uh, later on had to be my own advocate for uh, creating safety for myself. It's not about control. It's not about power over someone. It's really about safe safety. Because if I don't know what, what you are thinking, uh, then it's less. It's more likely that it's going to be a less so-called successful or pleasurable experience for both of us. In order to create a win, the the communication is so important. So we talk about the before, and um, uh, when I start going into this uh, so-called framework of the communication, I think some people get intimidated. Wow, there are so many things. Uh, wow, I don't know how to do this. Wow, it seems like it's very difficult. Wow, it seems like it takes a very long time. It doesn't have to take a long time. It can be literally as fast as one minute. So for instance, uh, let me demonstrate this, okay? So let's say you do a check-in and then you say, hey, um, so, uh, uh, so just to check, like you're open to having sex with me, and uh, so how are you feeling? Um, are you are you are you doing okay? Do you need to use the bathroom? Um, and uh, you know, at this point, even if you didn't ask them whether they're hungry, you just say, do you need to use the bathroom? Uh, are you are you like okay? You know, it gives them an opportunity to say whether they're not okay or they need something, and so you don't have to go into it extensively like what my partner uh, would do but you could just go into it a little bit and go through this uh framework so if I, so uh, coming back to my uh, demonstration so you can go into hey we're gonna have uh we, you're open to having sex with me so uh are you are you like okay is there anything that you would like to tell me uh so this is what i'm thinking that uh, i would like to do uh what do you think about it and uh what i would not like to have happen is this so it literally takes less than, a, it can literally take less than a minute. So do not be intimidated by the idea of uh, talking about, about sex a little bit before sex because what this does is it creates safety. Both of you are on the same wavelength. Then there's also less uh, second guessing. So now let's move on to during. So what happens during sex? So the during of the sex is really, having talked about it, the during of the sex is really, 
a uh, little bit going into the unknown. You can have the best of intentions. You you ha can have the desire like you really want to please your partner and things like that during. However, um, sometimes uh, communication during sex can be really uh, tricky for some people. Some people really do not like to talk about sex during sex because they, and I'm, I'm making some assumptions, but it seems almost as if um, there's this, magical spell of sex that is so mystical and magical and sacred that sometimes people do not want to break the spell of the moment and so they may have difficulty speaking up so what i've started to suggest to my clients who really need communication during sex itself is to ask themselves are you with someone who is more of a open-ended question kind of a person during sex or more close-ended kind of a person during sex so rather than expect no communication during sex how about if you need to communicate uh, at a level that was comfortable to your partner so if your partner was a more close-ended question kind of person then you ask questions not on the oh, less uh, chit chat during sex kind of a person but more like oh let's ask questions on the need to ask basis so for instance asking them questions close-ended like are you okay so then it's very easy for them to say yes or no and they can even say yes or no by nodding their head or shaking their head without needing to say words so then they don't break the magical spell of sex so asking them questions on the need to ask basing framing it as a close ended question so they can nod their head or shake their head so they can uh, also use uh, signals or code words for instance uh, hand gestures so so when it comes to during sex close ended questions can be around uh, are you okay are you in pain can i continue is this uh, pressure, rhythm, technique? Okay, uh, are you close to coming? So this is where all the nodding and shaking of head can really help. So this is one way of navigating uh, when someone has lack of practice around communication during sex or difficulties communicating during sex. You can kind of use this as a, a, a supporting way of uh, communicating about sex during, before or after. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, close-ended or open-ended questions. So now let's go into the after. So after sex, uh, what do you do about after? So a lot of people just roll over and fall asleep, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But some people, uh, they would love to have some kind of uh, continuation of the connection. And uh, they would love to have some intimacy and also some learning of each other. So this is when the communication of sex would be a great way to get feedback about the session. So some questions that you can ask after sex, and it doesn't have to be immediately after, it can be the next day, it can be after you nap, and then you start talking about it. So it doesn't have to be like immediately after, it can it can be, it can be immediately after if your partner is open to it, or it can be after you have a nap, or it can be the day after or the week after. Uh, or the next session, you can actually start to do a little bit of debrief before you have uh, sex again. So anything and at any point after is what I'm trying to say. So after, so after sex, uh, some of the things that you can ask and uh, be very mindful, I intentionally ask open-ended questions so that they can say as little or as much as they would like. Meaning, uh, how was it? How was the session? You can, you can just ask that. And your partner may be uh, somebody who doesn't really uh, talk so much, uh, some a partner who's non-communicative or even uh, non-verbal. They might uh, um, point to pictures or uh, words. Um, however, when it comes to the after, how was it? So it's it's like a freestyle. So let's say you you have a partner who's not very communicative, and then you ask the question, how was it? And your know, partner says something like very vague, like okay, it was good, uh, and doesn't say anything else. So as somebody who would like to encourage communication, so then you can share your side of the story, and then you can say, is it okay if I share how it was for me? Ask for permission, and then you share. Okay, knowing that they have only shared like one or two words, maybe you be very mindful of not flooding them by not by going on and on for like half an hour or 10 minutes or something like that, but sharing a little bit and then coasting it out of them. So that was how it was for me. But I was just curious, uh, uh, what was good about it for you? Like, what did you like? Okay, so it, it's really quite demoralizing. If everything about sex was bad or, you know, they say, yeah, it was good. Then you can ask them, okay, so I'm really curious, like what was good about it? Could you give me like uh, uh, an example? Like in what way was it good for you? Uh, and if they are very um, hesitant to share with you, this is when you can say, um, this is when you can say, 
um, I really want to know because I really uh, care about you. I want to get to know you better. That's all. So uh, talk in a very light-hearted uh, way and in somewhat of a detached way. So uh, these are some tips around uh, talking about sex after sex. How was it? What was good about it? Uh, uh, what would make it better? And uh, then also, uh, what, what sh should we try uh, next time? So, uh, so on that note, uh, I hope that uh, these uh, five ways to be an epic lover has been useful to you. The first one is approach, second is touch, third one is build up, uh, fourth one is mirror, and uh, then uh, communication. So uh, do share with me on the link below um, whether this uh, a session has been useful, what did you learn? And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My website is Eros Coaching, that's eroscoaching.com, and my website is drmartali at eroscoaching.com. You can find uh, this show at eroscoaching.com backslash uh, Eros Evolution Show. And uh, do subscribe to my mailing list so you never miss a thing. So next week, I'm going to be having uh, my friends uh, to talk about uh, what it's like uh, being mothers. Uh, in Singapore, we're going to have Mother's Day. And uh, I have my friend Kara Gokko and uh, Felicia Tan sharing uh, their relationship uh, being mothers and uh, also around their relationship with their sexuality. So this has been Martha. Uh, and thank you for listening to Eros Evolution. Bye.